All right, welcome to our next AP Computer Science lecture. We're going to continue to talk about traversing arrays today. Um, but as I normally do, we're going to treat this like a normal class. There's going to be warm-ups, exercises, opportunities to pause the lesson, take some notes, participate with the activities, give yourself feedback if you're on track, if there's something you want to review. So we'll start with a warm-up. Uh, I've playfully named this method Triceratops because uh, I'll pause here while you try and figure out what this little uh, code snippet does. All right, so let's break it down. Uh, we are going to start with the method header uh, and its signature, see what's going on here. So public static void, we know it's not supposed to return anything. Triceratops, certainly that is not an identifier that will speak to the purpose of this code, but maybe. And we see that it's going to take an array of type int, and we're going to call that array nums. So we're going to give this method, when we call it, a group of numbers, a group of integers, and let's see what we do with it. We start out with a for loop, initializing i at zero, i goes up until nums.length, and right away if I'm reading this code, I'm thinking to myself, hmm, a for loop that starts at zero goes up until, but not including the length of an array, we're probably going to traverse an array, we're probably going to visit every element in array, walk across that array. I++ plus plus will be our updater. So we look, when we go into the array, we say, hey, if nums of i mod 2 equals 1, holy moly, what does that mean? Well, so i will start out at 0. So accessing nums of i means go get me the first element, the element that has index of 0, which is going to be a number. Mod it by 2, check if that's equal to 1. Well, we've done enough of this command before to recognize that this is the way we determine if something is odd. So I'm saying if the element at location 0 is odd, print out i. Now your first impulse might be to think, oh, so we're just going to print out all of the odd numbers in an array, but that's actually not the case. That is um, a pitfall, and one that I'm almost certain will be uh, laid before you in the AP test coming up in May, uh, which is they will try and get you to think that printing out this variable is the same thing as printing out the element, when what's actually true is, well, i is the index of my for loop, and the first time through I go through my for loop, i is zero, it allows me to get the zeroth element of nums, the next time through i is one, it allows me to get the uh, index one element of nums, and so on and so forth. So i is actually going to be the index of the odd numbers. So say uh, nums had a length of 5, and it was the elements at index uh, 1 and 4 that were odd. Well, this is going to print out uh, 1 and 4, not what element is it 1 or 4. Again, it's going to be the index. So a little bit of a twist there, a little bit of a surprise. If I actually wanted to print out that element, I would say nums of i. So system out to print line nums of i. So triceratops prints out the index of all odd numbers of an array of ints. That's our warm up. All right, so again, this is advanced array traversal. It's a continuation of section 7.2 from our textbook. And <clears throat> here's a diagram we've shown in previous lectures, but it's worth revisiting. When we talk about an array, the way that um, your computer views the array is it's going to reserve one location in memory. That's what this box on the left here represents. And it's going to give that location a name. This is the uh, identifier that you pick is going to help find this box. And it is that box which is connected to another string of boxes, which is where we store the values of the array. So when I ask for, hey, what is list? And we arrive at this box, well, list is pointing us to the other locations where we keep the values. That's how the computer manages this. So the question we find ourselves asking is, how would I print an array? Okay, well, um, before we get to that, let's decide how we would declare an array. In a previous lesson, we thought of a couple different ways. 
I will pause here and see if you can think how we would do that. Certainly I could say an array of int called list equals new array of int um, of length five, and then populate in list of zero is 18, list of one is negative 12, list of two is 42, list of three is three, list of four is negative one. That would be six commands to do it, or as I'm gonna recommend, let's go ahead and use that shortcut, right? An array of int called list contains these five elements. Well, if I wanted to print this out, you know, maybe as we've done with all of our variables, we can declare variables of type int and variables of type string. And when we print out the variable name associated with those variables, we get what we're looking for. But something really kooky happens when we try to print um, an array. And that's we get this gobbledygook. And what's really fascinating is if I ran this code on my computer, I might get this you might get something different. And the reason is this bizarro output right here is the product of, it's telling you a little bit about where this box is located in memory. This is some kind of identifier that your computer is using to figure out where to find list. So when you ask it, hey, you wanna print out list? It thinks its assumption is that you're talking about this um, address that it uses to figure out where list is when obviously we'd really actually prefer something that looks closer to this. Well, how could we do that? Um, here is an option. I'm going to pause here because you're going to want to write that down in your notes. That bottom most command, arrays.toString, <clears throat> excuse me, arrays is a class that we have access to, and we can call its methods statically, much like we do integer.parseInt, helps us convert strings to ints, um, you know, character, I think it's character is uppercase, right? We have these classes, uh, math.random, where uh, we're allowed to go get these methods from other classes. Arrays is the same way, and the arrays class has a method called toString. ToString takes an array as a parameter, and it returns this beautiful output that we're looking for right here. Creates a little uh, box brackets. Makes sense because we associate those uh, box brackets, those angle brackets with arrays. Puts the numbers in there, separated by commas. Looks beautiful just like that. So arrays.toString. If you'd like to quickly know what the contents of your array are, that's how I recommend you print it. You know, we might want to customize our output a little bit. Let's say we wanted to print each number on its own line. We weren't thrilled with this format. We want something a little bit different. Well, we could use, a, there's a couple different methods here. There's the for each loop. And I think if we have a special way we want to print the contents of an array, a for each loop is perfect for that, right? For each visits every element of a collection of an array and it allows you to handle that item briefly and do something with it. In this case, we want to print it. So for each, I think is our best solution. If for loop is more to your taste, um, for sure, this would be the equivalent way to do it with a for loop. I will note um, for each is an important concept for the AP test. So you may not prefer it, but it is a skill that we should practice. And it's also really for traversing arrays. It is very, very valuable. So it is worth noting. Well, what if we wanted to print out all the numbers separated by commas? How would we do it? Well, separated by commas, I would bet that's going to make us think of a fence post algorithm, right? Because if I look at the output that I had right here, I see that there's commas between all my numbers, but there's no comma before my first number. There's no comma after my last number. So I'm gonna need some kind of a fence post, right? Normally we had post and then bar and then post and then bar and then post and then bar and then post, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and plant that post and that's what this first statement is doing right here. Um, go ahead and print out the first element of list. We assume list is a collection of, um, I think it's a collection of ints. And then we hop down here to our for loop. And instead of far starting our for loop down at zero, we're gonna start it at one, because you know what? I already planted that first post. I already printed the first element of this collection. So int i equals one, i less than list.length i plus plus. This is gonna go through and it will print uh, everything out, um, it'll print everything out uh, with a comma between it. 
there's an important question I want you to ask, and, and this is really to understand why we use four loops versus four each loops. Why is one better sometimes and, and not as good in other cases? Uh, this notion of printing out the contents of an array with all the numbers separated by a comma does not really lend itself well to a for each loop. I'm going to pause here, see if you can come up with the reason why. All right, so hopefully what you thought was for each is guaranteed to visit every element. I cannot pick and choose uh, which elements for each is going to check. Its purpose is to start at the first element and work all the way to the last. We cannot change which elements it checks. We cannot change which direction it goes. It goes from first element to last element. And in order to pull off this fence post, I have to be able to do something special with the first element and then take the next element and progress onward. So for each makes a ton of sense for if I'm just printing out all the elements, I'm treating all the elements the same, for each is great. Um, and another thing to note is I'm not trying to assign any values to my array. For each, not great for assigning values. But um, it is good if I just need to quickly access every element in order to do something basic with it. That would be important. If I have something more complex to do, a for loop might be a better way to traverse your array. All right, so let's talk about um, a number of different techniques, a number of different tools that we could use with arrays. And an example I've come up with is called counting elements. The idea is I want to have an array. I want to know how many times a certain number appears. Okay, And the method header for this is obviously going to return an int because I want to know the number of times this value appears. It's going to take an array. I want to know... Uh, give me a collection of numbers, and I want to know what number is it that I'm looking for that I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to pause here. I'm going to give you the opportunity. Go ahead and try and write some code in your notes. Pause the video, and I will show you a solution that I came up with, and I want you to compare your solution to my solution. So we'll pause here. All right, so let's talk about what we want to do. Well, we're trying to visit every element of an array. And I do want to visit every element. I do want to do something basic with it. I'm not trying to assign anything. So I'm thinking the for each loop is the tool for this job. Um, I initialize a variable count. Uh, I want to know how many times this key value is going to appear. So uh, count is going to be the value I intend to return. And while I'm going through my loop, I say, hey, if the element I'm handling, and in this case we're calling my element x, if the handle element I'm handling is the key value, well, let's go ahead and up that count value by one. And then we're done with our check, and that's really all we need to do for each for loop, is just go through, if the element you're looking at is the right one, update count. And when you're done, return count, close your method, and away you go. Let's try index of. So um, there are a lot of ways to access the elements of an array, and you won't necessarily always need to create your own, but I think it's a valuable exercise for figuring out how to make methods with an array, so let's be clear about what we're looking for. I want to find the index of a particular element. So say there's an array of 10 numbers, I want to know, hey, is there a 7 in here somewhere? So we would say public static int index of, and again, give me a group of numbers and some key value that I'm looking for. I'm going to pause here, give you a chance to try and write this method down. Okay, so here was my solution. Your solution might vary. Um, I started out, in this case, with a for loop. And let's talk about why. So I'm going to go through the whole array. Uh, I want to start with the first element and go through the last element. And I want to do something kind of basic. Why didn't I just use a for each loop? Well, the reason is I'm going to care about the index of the array, right? So if I have 10 numbers, I want to know if 7 is in there. Well, when I find 7, i got to be able to report back where it was. Was it at index 2? Was it at in index 8? i got to, I got to be able to report that back. If I use a for each loop, I have no idea where I am in the loop as it goes through. So I elected to use 
a for loop. That way I can track which end index it was I found the number at. If the element at location i in this array matches my key value, let's go ahead and return that. And close our if statement, close our for loop, and close our method. Hopefully you're thinking to yourself that there is a logical flaw in my method. Something that I have not considered. What would that be? Well, here's the concern. What if the key value does not appear in the array? What should I do? This is a common problem that comes up in programming. And most methods that you will encounter that care about indexes, like if go looking for this index and tell me where it is, as a default, they like to return negative one if they don't find um, the value you're looking for. So what I should have done is I should have put down a return uh, negative one value right here, which would just mean that if I made it the whole way through the for loop and I never triggered this middle um, statement right here, once the for loop had completed, it would return negative one as a default because that would mean I had not found the element. And in fact, I'd be willing to bet that if I plugged this program into my IDE, uh, the compiler would likely bark at me and say that returning a value is not guaranteed and I do need to put some kind of a return statement at the end of the method, which I could easily handle by putting in return negative one. All right, so how about replace all occurrences? So what if I had a collection of numbers and I thought to myself, you know what? I don't want any threes to appear in that collection. I instead want to replace it with fives, something like that. How would I set that up? Well, method header could be uh, public static void. We don't need to return anything. We're just manipulating our array. Um, and the three parameters I would need are what's my collection of numbers? What's the number I'm looking to replace? And what's the value I want to replace it with? I'll pause here while you take a shot at writing this method down. Okay, so let's think about it. I've elected to use a for loop here. Let's talk about why. Well, I am visiting every element and um, I am, so you would think maybe a for each loop is what I'm looking for, but uh, I need to be able to assign new values to some of the locations that I get. Uh, so what that means is um, I definitely cannot use a for each loop. I need to use something more complex. So the answer is um, if I go looking uh, at the element I'm currently at, so if in the array at index i, I find that key value, let's change array index of i to my replacement value. Close my if statement, uh, close the for loop, close the method. That one's actually not too painful. How about testing for equality? What if I have this array and that array and I want to know if they're the same? Well, what would that mean? You know, testing if numbers are equal, that's pretty straightforward. Does it have the same amount? Seven is equal to seven. Seven is not equal to eight. Strings testing for equality also not too painful, right? Hello is equal to uh, hello. It is not equal to jello, right? Because the letters are different. Well, what would it mean for arrays to be equal? Let's, let's investigate that. Uh, arrays inequality is a little more complex because you have to consider not only what types of elements are in your array, but also what is their location, right? There is one really fast way to determine equality, and it comes from that helpful arrays class that we saw earlier. I can just use arrays.equals and pass it to arrays, and it will return true if they're equal. It would return false if they're not. That's one valuable way to do it. I think it is useful to go through the exercise to define this method ourselves. So let's take a look at that. Um, what would it mean for two arrays to be equal? Well, they got to be the same length and they got to be the same values at each index. So arrays of, uh, you know, if I had one array was 3, 1, 4, and the other one was 3, 4, 1, that same length, that same values, but they're not in the right order. So we got to make sure. Uh, what is it index zero of this array and what is it index zero of that array matches? What's it index of 
one of this array and index of one of this array matches. So let's let's look at the example. Um, this is going to be a few lines of pseudocode. Remember that term. That is where I take the time to write out, often as a comment, what my expectation is for my program. And if ever I'm doing something kind of complex, it can really pay dividends. It can make the, everything go much faster to take a moment and decide what is it I'm trying to do, uh, what does it look like if it's done completely, what tools am I going to need. So let's review. Uh, I've got a comment here that talks about my method header, right? It needs to take two arrays of the same type, and it's got to return a Boolean. The first array, uh, if the first array does not have the same length as the second array, we're done. It doesn't matter if I'm comparing 3141 to 314. They might have the same first three values, but they're not the same length, so they can't be equal. Um, let's go through the arrays, meaning let's traverse it using a for loop. And if the values at the same index don't match, return false. If I can make it the whole way through the array and I don't find any mismatched values, that's probably going to be true. All right, so let's find a way to transform these four comments into some Java. In fact, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to pause again, see if you can take my four pieces of pseudocode and this method header and define this in your notes. We'll pause here. Okay, so let's go through it. If the first array does not match the same array, the second array in length, we got to return false. Well, here's how I tackle that. I said, hey, look, if array one, if your length is not the same as array two, we're done, return false. Don't execute any commands beyond that. If they are the same length, then that won't trigger and we'll head down here. Uh, I want to traverse the arrays using a for loop. And if the values at the same index do not match, return false. Let's talk about why I did not use a for each loop here. The reason is I got to access values at uh, two different arrays, right? So for each makes a lot of sense if I just want to walk simply all the values of one array. But if I need index zero of one array and index zero of another array, I can't do that with one for each loop. So that's why I chose a for loop again. Starting at zero, going to array one dot length. I could have said array two dot length because we've verified they're the same length here, but I chose array one. And we say, hey, look, if when I am traversing the loop and at index i, I find a value in array one that is different than index i in array two, well, we're done. That can't be a match. We're going to return false, right? Now, if I can walk the whole array comparing its values to the other, and this never triggers, meaning these two values are always the same, well, we probably have a match, right? It is true that those two arrays are equal. Close out our method, and we're good to go. All right, so let's tackle uh, an especially spicy problem. I love this problem because I've heard, um, you know, we're very fortunate to have a lot of industry volunteers in the classroom, and I've heard multiple programmers in our computer lab say that reversing the elements of an array or reversing a string is a pretty good warm-up interview question that you might actually see in industry. Um, I, you know, think that's pretty cool. And that's actually a skill that we can start looking at here. So let's look at the problem. I've got a, a collection of numbers, an array of numbers that I've called list. There's those seven values there. Um, Reversing an array is not too painful if we're allowed to create a new array. The reason for that is uh, something might be beyond us for right now, but just believe me when I say making a new array and filling it is not so painful. Let's instead say that for whatever reason we were restricted to only using one array and uh, we want to swap all their values. So what is it? Index zero is going to hop on down here to index six. Uh, index one goes to five. Index two goes to four and index three will stay where it's at. Well, if we're gonna be flipping values back and forth, we gotta review what we call in my classroom the bad swap, right? So if I have a variable called X and I assign it Y, I have a variable called Y and I assign it X, it doesn't matter if X and Y are 
ints or strings or whatever it is, this isn't the right way to exchange values, right? Because um, X now possesses what was in Y. And when we try to say Y, go get what was in X, X no longer remembers what it used to be. It now has the identity of Y. So after these two lines of code execute, um, both X and Y will have the value that was stored in Y initially. So what's the right way to fix this? Uh, we got to have a temporary variable, store X in the temporary variable, then give Y's value to X, then give Y the value that was stored in temp, because temp was what X originally was. So remember, got to use three variables to swap around those values. All right, so often a challenging problem like swapping all the values of an array can be made much easier if we break it down into its manageable chunks, right? In computer science, we call that procedural decomposition. It's a tremendous life skill. So I think that rather than trying to swap all the elements of the array mirrored across the middle, let's just write a method whose job it is to swap two elements and see what that would look like. Um, so I want to put a value at the first index into a temporary variable to make sure we're okay. This is my pseudocode. Uh, set the first index to the value of the second index. Set the second index to the value of the temporary variable. And then we're ready to perform the swap. Um, I've got the method header right here, right? So it's got a, uh, we're just swapping. We don't need to return anything. So the return type is void. The collection is called list. And I want what's index i to go to index j. I want an index, what's that index j to go to index i. I'm going to pause here. I'm going to see if you can go ahead and write down this method. See what you got. Okay. So we want to take the element at i stored as our temporary variable. Then, now that i is available, I'm going to take what the element at j stored at i. Now, I'm going to take uh, element j and what I stored at temp, bring it over there. So now the two values are swapped and we're good to go. Uh, we have exchanged two values in an array. I would be sure to put this method in your notes. I think it's pretty valuable. All right, so let's try to take advantage. We've got the method swap. Let's assume that the swap method exists in the same class as the one where we're trying to swap, um, mirror the array, right? Reverse the order of the array. So we're allowed to use swap in our solution. Um, what is wrong with the following logic of reversing the array? So let's take a look at this. I've got a for loop whose job it is to go from zero to length and what it does is it takes an int, and this might be a little tricky at first, but hang with me, we can explain this. So list.length is how long the list is. If there's five numbers in the list, then list.length is five. I do list.length minus one because I would like to know what the last allowable index is of, um, of the list array. So if there are five elements in the array, the last index I can go seek out is index four, right? Uh, a five element array has indices of zero, one, two, three, and four. The reason I go get um, and subtract i is think about what's happening to this for loop as it updates, as it iterates, right? So when we start out, i is zero, list.length minus one is four, four minus zero is four. So when i is 0, j is 4. Those are the two values uh, most distant from the middle of the array, right? It's the first value and the last value, okay? And so that allows me to swap the first value and the last value. Then we update i becomes 1. List.length is 5 minus 1 is 4. But now i is 1, right? So I say 4 minus 1 is going to give me 3. And now i is 1 and j is 3. So this allows me to swap indices 1 and 3, right? So see how that works? Uh, j is always what is the index that I'm going to mirror at. This is a pretty useful uh, command for when you're trying to go the opposite direction as another index. I'm sure some of us figured this out in our previous projects. But if it's not in your notes, um, go ahead and put that in. But I'll tell you. This does not actually reverse the array. And I know what you're thinking. Well, 
I started at zero, I went through the end of the list, and I swapped every one. What could be the problem? Well, here's the problem. If I swap, uh, so here we have seven elements. Uh, index is one, two, three, four, five, excuse me. Whew. Index is zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. And I were to run this through a variable table, wa uh, watch it work, it's going to swap when i is zero, it swaps zero and six. When i is one, it swaps one and five. When i is two, it swaps two and four. When i is three, it'll swap three with three. That'll do nothing. But then look what happens. When i is four, it's going to swap four and two. So think about this. We had already swapped two and four. Then we swapped three and three. Then we swapped four and two. So right here, we had swap, 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 swap. We were done, but then because our for loop is built to go to the end of the list, it comes here. This had exchanged one and seven. So after we'd exchanged this element, this was now seven, but then we go and swap it back. We put the seven back here and the one back here. This piece of text leaves an array unchanged. It moves all of the values around and then moves them back. So let's ask ourselves, what is the solution? Well, I don't need to swap the whole length of the list, right? What I need to do is I need to swap half the length of the list. And that makes sense. We had seven elements on the last page. We need to swap when i is 0, 1, and 2. 3 did not need to swap because it's right in the middle. And 4, 5, and 6 don't need to be swapped because they were swapped when 3, 2, and 1 were, were swapped. So common logical error. Um, it's a good thing to, to note that you don't want to go the whole way through the array. Um, you should note that this is probably looking a lot like some of the string traversal algorithms that we did earlier in the school year, right? So the same way that we traverse an array with a for loop where I go from i up until the length of my array is the exact same thing I did with a string. Go from uh, zero, i is zero, on up through till string dot length. Remember, slight difference, arrays do not have the parentheses here because it is not a method that goes to return the value of length. An array just knows inherently what its length is, whereas string is required to uh, call a method which determines how long the string is and returns it back to us. So. Uh, traversing an array and traversing a string looks very similar. You go from zero up until the length of whatever it is you're traversing. All right, there's our homework and our reading questions. Have an excellent day.